Today's Lunch and Learn topic is going to be about right-sizing your business, and Barry Harvey of Business Condo Experts will be taking the lead on that conversation. So I'm Tom Ardrow, the Executive Director here at the North Phoenix Chamber of Commerce, and we are bringing this Lunch and Learn series um, to, the, to the business owners in North Phoenix. We've been recording this. Uh, these throughout the month of April. We're going to continue into May, I'm pretty sure, at some capacity, not a dozen a month, but um, these are designed to bring some practical firsthand knowledge and uh, takeaways right away that you can implement in your business. And so that's the um, goal for these Lunch and Learns. We have Barry Harvey today from Business Condo Experts. He's one of our chamber members and is going to tell us about finding the right size space for your business. So Barry, I'm going to let you uh, let you drive. I'm going to put everybody else on mute here. Go ahead, sir. All right. I've been a commercial real estate broker since 1994, so over 25 years. I've seen a number of business cycles. This is going to be another cycle that we're all going to have to deal with. And right sizing your business may be one of those choices for you. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And get into presentation mode. Can everybody see this? All right, so right sizing your business space uh, can be challenging, but it also could be um, you know, some of the motivation that you need to, to get things set up for the new environment. I do need to, need to do a disclaimer. Uh, I am a commercial real estate broker licensed in the state of Arizona, there, but I am not a real estate attorney. So any of these points of information that you may feel that may affect your business that may have a sub civil impact, you may want to discuss it with your attorney or counsel with that. So the new way in this new environment is how do I figure out how much space I need for my company? And the old adage used to be approximately 250 square feet per employee, but now that we will probably be eliminating some of the infrastructure for your business, such as meeting space, common meeting space may be replaced by using Zoom, Google Meets, Microsoft Teams, some type of virtual meeting. That space most likely can be repurposed or eliminated from your office space. One of the important things that we're gonna need to think about is parking. So now that we're having a higher density for your business, you're going to need to look at the buildings with six to seven parking spaces per thousand square feet of office. So this will impact your size. Some of the older buildings don't have this healthy of a parking ratio. So everything that I say can be impacted based on the parking. One of the things you're gonna to wanna to look at too is you're gonna to need to go to hard offices and or cubes. If you have the low standard cube size, you're probably gonna to have to either modify or get cubes that are probably higher to the ceiling that's going to help with the uh, physical distancing. The other thing you're gonna to wanna to do is you are gonna to wanna to add some what I call flex workspaces. This is where you've got some space set aside, and this may be, again, one of the meeting room areas that you're gonna repurpose to providing space for people that occasionally come into the office if they can't be doing virtual for whatever reason. The other thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is look at, just like the hospitals have throughout their floors, have hand sanitizer stations so that you can promote the, the cleanliness of moving around the office and touching objects. The other thing that a lot of people need to think of, and it's optional, but 
thinking about eliminating break rooms and any shared areas where you're going to have a high impact of physical touching of things that it's going to be common throughout the entire office. So let's take a look at one of the first steps that you're going to do once you've determined that you need to right size your business. If your current space cannot be adaptable, you're going to want the first thing is to check your lease. And as you can see underneath checking your lease, there's usually going to be a section that covers assignment and subleasing of your space. So you want to be aware of your responsibilities and the landlord's responsibilities with that regard. I have not seen a lease that hasn't had this clause. It's possible that yours doesn't, but make sure you've got that language in your lease. The next step you're gonna to wanna to do before you do anything drastic, you're gonna to wanna to contact your landlord and express your interest in possibly subleasing your space if your term is too far out to mitigate any changes that you need to make. And you might be surprised. The landlord may need some or all of your space for another tenant. There's gonna be a lot of movement. So letting them know will give them an opportunity to let you know if they can be helpful in taking over your space before the term of your lease ends. They may be willing to abate your rent. Preferably if they do that, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that they extend to the end of your lease, not just try to get a lump sum payment after a certain period. So my recommendation is to do an addendum and have whatever rent you don't pay or get abated tacked on to the end of your lease. The other thing they may be able to do is move you to a smaller space in their building. That could accomplish a lot of things. You already have a relationship with the landlord. If they have a lot of movement in the building, that may be a good choice also. The other thing they may be able to do, if logistically possible, is to make your space smaller. Now, some buildings are more conducive than others for that. The other thing to consider is that while that's going on, you're gonna be in under construction status when they're modifying your, your space. So that may or may not be conducive to what you wanna do. After you've contacted your landlord and gotten a feel for their cooperation and what they're willing to do for you, then your next step is gonna to be to get some professional help. You're gonna to wanna to talk to your attorney, real estate attorney preferably, since they have experience with this. You're gonna to wanna to interview some real estate brokers to see how they can assist you in this process, and then talk to your CPA about the ramifications of your budget with making a change. You're gonna to wanna to create a budget for moving. And the reason why that's important, you may find that the cost of moving is prohibitive for the length you have on the lease, and it may just be premature to try to make a change when the time you have left on your lease the, the possible reduction in rent is not worth the cost of moving before the end of the term. And then next is gonna be your new space checklist. You're gonna to wanna to find these things out before you even consider a move. Does your facilities have, the, that you're looking at, have the data bandwidth that you're gonna need for this new environment? And you're going to, get, going to want to have choices of multiple vendors. There's a lot of pockets in the valley where they have exclusive rights. And you do not want to get into a building where you're ending up with one vendor. That could really create problems for your business based on the changes you need to make moving forward. You also want to verify that the parking is adequate. Even though it may look like a huge parking lot at the building, you're gonna to wanna to go through and make sure that any space that's there has sufficient parking for your employees that will be working on site. 
You're also going to want to look at the impact of the commute to the employees. You might find a great deal out in Goodyear, but will your employees make that commute? If they're not willing to make that commute, then you can get the best deal with the best building, but it's going to hamstring your business if the employees are going to be unhappy. Then the other thing you want to do if you've gotten your list of what I call the short list of buildings, you're going to want to actually talk to the other tenants. And a lot of people don't do this. And I don't know why, but, you know, it's sort of like if you were to move into a neighborhood and you end up didn't like your neighbors, then that's going to be one miserable place to live. Same thing with your business. You want to know who's in the building and what we call the tenant mix can be very, very important. Then once you've made the choice in the new building and you signed the lease, you're going to want to have your data installed and tested before move-in. And I would recommend at least a week. And if you are having issues with the providers, see if you can extend the move-in date until those get, things get resolved. In this day and age, with, with the virtual business environment we're going to be in, if your data is non-functional, you're not going to be able to be functional in your business. If you're going to be moving furniture and you end up having excess furniture, just realize in this market, and it's been this way for quite some time, the furniture really has little or no value. You may even actually have to pay people to dispose of it. So make those arrangements before you get the moving trucks to move your business. I recommend for all my businesses to switch to Wi-Fi. Cabling anymore in regardless of the building is very expensive and doesn't give you necessarily the flexibility as Wi-Fi. And with the quality of Wi-Fi these days, you and Wi-Fi extenders, you can accomplish good quality bandwidth probably in any space just via Wi-Fi. The other thing you want to do is look at switching to a virtual phone system. That'll let you have a lot of flexibility in moving around personnel and actually connecting to a virtual phone system that can go to people's homes. And two of the top are Ring Central and Vonage. So look at that. You may even want to do that before you move. It gives you a lot of flexibility to appear to be stable in your communications, even though you may be making a physical move in the future. And always get three bids from any moving company. And I hate to get touchy-feely, but pick the one, not based on the lowest price, but the one you feel most confident that's going to meet your deadlines and accomplish what you need to have done. At this point, I'm open for questions since every company is unique and we can discuss individual thoughts. Hey, Barry. Hey, Jeff. Hey, so I'm absolutely blown away by this, all right? Um, because I'm a single, I've worked on my own and all that. And I just didn't realize that the ramifications of this for bigger businesses, uh, making the cubicles, no more cube farms, no more prairie dogging, they gotta take them up to the ceilings and all that. I mean, I don't know how everybody else feels on this. I feel that there's there's a big rush to a rush to something that is unnecessary at a point. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I just I'm blown away that this is this is going to be our new the our new um, uh, way of uh, doing business um, and that. I don't know if anybody else feels the same way, but I just, I never even thought about, um, about that. 
I don't know how some businesses are even going to survive survive this if that's going to be their norm. Was there a question in there, or just you just wanted to make? I I just I'm blown I'm just blown away. I mean, it was a fantastic presentation, Barry, um, and uh, you know the, the things that you said about getting three bits. Um, the voice over telephone systems are great. Um, be careful when you. Um, my suggestion would be if you if you're a business and you have to go uh, look up Ring Central, uh, be prepared. They um, they advertise like crazy and they'll follow you around and if you fill anything out they will call you every day I've had that situation um, so but it's a good it's a good system they just they're diligent about getting business well I've um, had clients that use them yes. and it's pretty seamless yes and that you can have people whether it's through their desktop laptop self they got a cell phone app and the phones, the thing that I sort of like my clients is that you control how your phone system works. So as you expand and grow or change, you can as an administrator dictate about how the calls are handled, where they're routed, who gets priority. Um, it, it's, and there's another bonus, if you have to make a quick move, your customers will never know it. Where if you're dealing with a typical phone system with hardware and other devices that have to be physically managed, um, that can be a big project in it of itself. Seven months ago, when we moved the chamber to the new office, we got rid of the physical phone system and went to a virtual uh, phones uh, per the recommendation of Cox business um, our business advisor at Cox and I can tell you it was it was a bit of a struggle um, to get that whole system set up it was not seamless so your advice of doing it before you make the move rather yeah, than totally. after is huge um, I don't think we had much of a disruption from the from the outside perspective anybody calling our phones for about a day got voicemail for a day or two and it was just a bit of a challenge for us to be able to pick up voicemail messages and get them returned but by the time we had things working I can tell you now the flexibility is incredible um, uh, what we're what I've ended up doing is um, setting up a, a mobile number for the chamber and just pushing our main line to uh, a virtual app sitting on that phone on a uh, mobile app so it's now seamless we can move around we can move around and um, the general public doesn't know it. They can't see it. So in terms of being able to operate virtual now, in this current situation, I've been at home for most of the past three weeks, here in the office occasionally, but at home for the most of the past three weeks, you can't tell. Nobody can tell. Um, so that was a great recommendation, Barry. Um, yeah, to reiterate, I had a client that didn't know how their business was going to be. They started virtual. They went to Ring Central. Uh, they started negotiations with the landlord. The landlord, unfortunately, had an onerous lease that basically said, you know, we don't care. Uh, we don't have to let you sublease. It's our sole discretion. And they need to do a quick move. And if it wasn't for Ring Central uh, being virtual, they could have literally been a window of maybe a week or two trying to scramble to get that resolved um, in the process of moving. Uh -huh. Yep. And then in terms of the flex workspace that you talked about, um, we were also, we just had an opportunity here at the chamber. So I'm going to make just a quick plug because I know this is going to go out on the video. Um, we've been in a position of um, acquiring a third uh, executive suite here at the chamber. So we have the two offices that we've been using for the seven months since we moved in here. And we just recently acquired a third adjacent space. And my entire intention, intention for that is to be able to create a flex workspace for chamber members to be able to stop in, check in, use the Wi-Fi, be able to get out of the home, 
and you know, and, and not work off your kitchen table, have a place to meet clients, et cetera. Um, so we're gonna have that option available here as soon as we're allowed to start, um, not physically distance ourselves at some point. <laughs> so uh, look, at, look for those uh, communications to be coming out from the chamber about that space being available. And again, I think the, the premise that we're on, the new, new way that businesses are working is try to get out of the mindset that distance is, is the issue, it's staying connected. So focus on the positive, what's the best way to stay connected. And one of the things I will do, I've been involved with some of the meetings with Ring Sync Orchestra has its own group meeting feature and they may have gotten better, but you're still gonna wanna have multiple options. And a lot of people, that's why when it comes to data bandwidth, don't go into a building where you only have one option, whether it's Cox for business, whether it's CenturyLink, um, or eight, which used to be AT&T. Uh, if you go into a building where you have one vendor, if issues arise because of their infrastructure or whatnot, you don't want to be stuck without having an alternative. So that doing a facilities check is is paramount and making sure that you have multiple options. <clears throat> Same way with group meetings, whether it's Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Google Meet, always have a backup plan and an account. Uh, they're not that expensive. I mean, what does the chamber pay for Zoom? Like 15 bucks a month? Yeah, and annualized that it was 100 and 149 a year. And we don't get cut off in 40 minutes and we can have, I don't know, a couple hundred people on the call. So. So Barry, are the Ring Central and Vonage, the virtual phones different than, um, in our office we have Verizon digital phones and we can move them seamlessly from place to place. Is it the same kind of thing? The biggest difference that I see is Ring Central and Vonage came from like the PBX world for large companies. Even though they work for small companies, if you have four or five people, it's mm -hmm. great. The thing is, it has some of the features and management capability that are far superior because they've been doing it the longest. Just an example say you're worried about a person <laughs> off site and their, their, their quality or quantity of work. Well, you can go in and see how many phone calls they accept, how long they're on the phone call, and you can actually record those phone calls with the appropriate message on the front end that may be required. So the thing that I was impressed with when my client showed me is they could go into the desktop app and they can manage all their extensions, see all the call logs, and be able to tell what was actually happening in their business. Plus those phone calls can be recorded too. Um, so they can they up um, with every, um, with those two companies. Absolutely. <clears throat> Joanne, the other, the other difference um, that you're, you're looking at um, too is the delivery system. Verizon uses the cell um, and that, and the the Ring Central and Vonage are going to use uh, use the internet, and so what whatever your internet provider is um, has a has a definite impact on uh, how your uh, how your phone system is going to be heard. Uh, if your if your yeah. internet system is is slow or having issues and all that, then your phone's going to have some issues too. But that's the same with Verizon and being out of service in certain areas um, as well. So there's definitely pluses and minuses to that, to that as well. And that doesn't happen with Vonage, because I thought Vonage was connected through your internet. And when I first moved out yes. here, actually, I took Vonage and I got rid of it. And this is 15 years ago, I hated it though. It the didn't good thing about <laughs> Ring Central and Vonage, they have ability to flip your call to your cell phone. So say, just like Jeff said, you have issues with the call, call quality doesn't seem to be as good as you would like. 
you can actually tell it to flip, put the people on hold, and you can flip the phone call to your cell phone. Wow. And Vonage is a different company than it was 15 years ago. Right. I'm not putting a plug in, plug in for them, but they um, they've definitely uh, changed their game and uh, and up their game from they were a mess 15 years ago. <laughs> it was a hard company to use and work with, but now um, I I agree with uh, um, with Barry. And you know you can still get the same services with Cox and probably your other um, internet uh, other internet providers too. You can get VoIP phone services um, that may not be as powerful, but they're still out there. Yeah, there's a lot of them. I just the reason why I talk about Ring Central and Vonage, they're the number one and number two. If you look at the top in 2020 virtual phone systems, they're either they're both one and two. And you can use your existing phone equipment with them, right? You don't need any, like we had to buy the Verizon phones or rent them or something. I don't know. They have dedicated phones, just like Verizon does, that you can buy. You know, I, I think it's sort of silly to do that when most people, you need to have good bandwidth for internet for your laptop and your desktop. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation is just use the save yourself money, just channel it through your computers or your cell phone. And, you know, because like I said, the hardware in two years, who knows what the hardware is going to be like. And most people, the other thing, most people, they keep their phones pretty current. So um, their cell phones. And then again, it gets, gets down to who is providing your bandwidth. And the only thing, if you run into lots of issues where you're always flipping your calls to your cell phone, then it might be time to read about your internet access and look at another vendor. Uh, and that's why you want multiple vendors at any building you're at. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, I had a question that kind of followed to the points in your presentation and uh, point at the beginning of the question and answer uh, portion here. Uh, your recommendations as far as essentially uh, sort of eliminating the normal cubicle style, having closed offices and potentially eliminating uh, break rooms and things like that, are those all things that you're seeing in, just in your industry from your clients and um, or I, I'm basically I'm trying to decide am I just being resistant to what the, the world is supposed to look like and uh, um, yeah, this actually or, started the truth of the matter I've seen meeting rooms and break rooms get smaller or smaller or non-existent over the I mean and that was even before it was probably created more by the last downturn mm -hmm. is everyone reevaluated that um, like I said before 2006 I would ask you how many employees you have now I would, I ask, since then, I've always asked, how many people office with you? Mm. And then the other question is, what type of amenities you want to provide? And, you know, some have gone full blown where they've got people working sort of 24 seven. And so they have had to provide break, food, all sorts of amenities to attract employees. Well, I think that's all going to probably go away. And and again, I don't get the question about how big, where's the break room? How big is the break room? The, that's not a top 10 list anymore. Uh, I think that's where when we were looking for our space, break room was, if it was in the building, then it was in the building. But for the most part, we saw it as wasted space. I needed enough room for a, a water tower and a fridge and a microwave. And that's all I really wanted in there yep. so. and then i'm even recommending you know the because it gets handled a lot <laughs> the refrigerator and that's always been an issue who's cleaning out the refrigerator what's getting yeah. stuck in it? so this is a sort of good way for business owners to get rid of that headache and say for health and safety reasons we will not you know order in have, have food delivered, go get out of the office, um, go pick up food. But the fact is storing food and handling it 
and dealing with that inside an office space, um, I, I see that going away. Wow. Wow. I don't know. Like this to do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did all the did this whole movement start in San Francisco? <laughs> Sorry, that was my bad joke of the day. Well, even for example, people used to have, have spent a lot of money wiring up their offices, and anymore the Wi-Fi is so good with the routers and extenders and the new ways of communicating through Wi-Fi. People don't even install wiring anymore. I think the only thing we have wired in our office, if I can remember off the top of my head, is our, our main printer that does the scansion uh, to one of our towers. Um, and that's pretty easy to put that close to your router yep. and run, it, run one cable versus running cables to every office. Mm. So um, That's got to make it a security, kind of a security difficulty, doesn't it, Justin, then? If everything's it's offline or as, online, there's Wi-Fi. Well, no, for, yeah, for, for, you mean from a, a bar perspective? Yeah. Uh, we can use we can use cloud storage and things like that, so long as that service company, essentially, and I mean they don't directly, but essentially what it is is I have to look for make sure they have the, the appropriate um, and encryption standards, as well as really the bigger issue because most of these places have the appropriate encryption. Really, the big bigger issue is who who owns the the, the mail. You know, can they keep my material? Can they get look at it and things like that? That's really the biggest issue, and it's just a confidentiality question. <laughs> no, this uses some kind of a fancy managed router that I don't really understand, but it was expensive, so there's that. Um, and uh, whatever security thing, we have to take reasonable precautions, so we have, Whatever reasonable security features, because um, you know you can you can live in a prison or you can live in a you know a house. It's the same same concept. Um, what's the best? What's the best? Like ironclad, um, at, at least on these different uh, CLEs and things that, that I, I participate in. Uh, most of the experts uh, come in and say that there's no foolproof way. If something if some whatever you have, they'll do. Um, it's really what we're from the bar and perspective of the CLEs I've sat in, is what we're trying to do is uh, make it not easy, so they go move on to somebody else. If it makes if it's too much too hard for their um, for them to get in, they'll they'll move on and find someone that doesn't have everything kind of set up. And, but yeah, no, it's been lost. Uh, they get their whole files stolen, and then they're basically held for ransom. Wow, that's a problem. <laughs> That's scary. So we we have to take um, and they you know they target big and they target bigger firms. But like I said, we, so we have the router, the firewall, the what have you, the, and uh, uh, we just have to try to make it more difficult than it's worth their time. Yeah, it's a, it's with bigger firms or with bigger companies. You know, they have five hundred, four or five hundred people coming in with four or five hundred email addresses, and yeah. it only takes one person to add or the phishing, a uh, phishing email yep. to give give everything, uh, get everything through. Yeah, and I've only got seven people that, and I, we look at each other. We have a pretty much an open platform um, in our office, so like I have everyone's email address open up uh, to my left right now, and so I I keep an eye on everything. And every once in a while, something suspicious comes through, and I say, don't open that. I don't know what it is, and I don't really care. Just don't open it. Uh, leave it alone. But um, so we're all. In each other's business all the time, so but it's mostly it's just for clients. Know, we like to keep an eye on clients. And stuff. I know Tom would admit to this too, but I mean, I get I get crazy emails, and, and I can pretty well spot a phishing email uh, pretty fast. But I've still clicked on them. You know, mm -hmm. we all have. You know, they, I, they I got an email. So good. I got an email from my uh, my accountant's office yesterday. And it was someone that I'd never heard of at the office and she has a small office. So I, I, they must have hired a new person, but it looked very suspicious the way that, and the questions they were asking me, I'm like, I'm pretty sure my client already knows these questions. So I, I, I had to call and just verify that, um, 
they were they were with that office because I don't think it'd be too difficult to steal a logo and put it on your email and send it to me and say I need this information. So I just said I had to call and verify that this person actually worked there. Kudos to you for taking the extra step. A lot of a lot of people would see the logo and you would see it coming straight from the company name and and rock and roll with it and not not think twice about it. I'm an attorney. I'm suspicious of everything. <laughs> Just because I'm not paranoid doesn't mean they're not watching, right? Yep. Exactly. Scammers are getting better and better. Even recently, I had something with, from Amazon, and it was just concerning enough that I did email Amazon directly and said, hey, blah, blah, are you asking for this? I didn't click on anything in the email, and they said no. They asked me to send them the email, blah, blah, and I did, but it was, it was very convincing. If I weren't... I come from a family of lawyers and accountants mostly, so I'm very suspicious <laughs> and made sure I checked. But otherwise, gosh, it's it they're getting really good at what they're doing. And they followed up with the second one saying, We sent you an email saying blah 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 blah. And this is your second warning or whatever it was. I mean, oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, scary. Well, great Larry. conversation today, Barry. Thank you for leading this. Uh, does anybody have anything else, Justin? Sound like you had, you had another comment here. I just want to say thank you to Barry. You definitely brought up some points that I, I hadn't considered. And again, I don't know if I'm just being resistant to the way things are going um, or not and not thinking about these things and considering th these things, but I definitely kind of opened my eyes to some, some potential issues and concerns that my employees might have, and I'll discuss it with them. Huh. Well, I'm glad I have helped. Yeah, absolutely. It opened my eyes. I had no idea the outside world was going to look like this. I don't know what this is going to do for for business. It's definitely going to change. And you're recommending if we do cubicle dividers that they go all the way up to the ceiling? Or like there's the some theories in that whether they should go all the way to the ceiling. I would talk to um, whoever puts together your your cubicles ask them what the standard what people are doing you have you have air circulation concerns if you go all the way to the ceiling um if there's no, and there and there could be code violations so you're going to want to ask because there's there's air circulation there's fire suppression so there's going to be a number of things that are required if you're going to modify cubes to go all the way to the ceiling yeah. So, um, I would I would just get a hold of your furniture professional and say, here's what we want to do and what is allowable from their understanding under the law and code, city codes. And every city, unfortunately, is going to be different. So, what Gilbert tells you you have to do may be totally different than what Avondale tells you to do. Yep. Um, and you know, the fire inspector is the one when they come through once a year, usually that's what they're supposed to do. Uh, we'll see if they keep that schedule and they're the ones that are going to catch it and write you up. Mm -hmm. That's been my experience with my clients in the past. Well, we and just have a building, so we're trying yeah. to decide, do we do cubicles or hard wall? But maybe hard walls, just the Yeah, building. I think you're going to see more of the hard walls. Um, you're going to get or you're going to see uh, modification of cubes with with location of sprinkler heads, uh, air conditioner return, and vents. And and uh, and the, here's what a lot of people don't know: for the last 10, 15 years, the fire suppression and detection is done through the duct work, and that's been going on for quite a while. So. That's the concern is um, if, it's, if it's smoke detectors, that's all through your duct work where of course your sprinkler heads are based on temperature. And then that's where you don't wanna get into having to re reposition sprinkler heads because that's pretty involved. So if they come in and see that you've done cubes up to the ceiling or put in new offices, hard offices, and they go in and there's not a sprinkler head, there's not a air conditioning vent or return, 
every mm -hmm. so many square feet, then they're going to write you up. Wow. So even with hard walls, it's still a shared air system. Yes. Right. So we're still breathing each other's air. It, 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 so. Yeah. Well, it gets down to the filter. If you're putting a HEPA filter, and again, I'm not an HVAC, right. uh, you know, expert, but what I think you're going to see is you're going to see different filters on the returns that may be able to mitigate that. So talk to whoever your HVAC vendor is. Um, and again, too bad John McComb isn't on the, this call. He might give us some insight on that. Right. Yep. And there may be some CDC recommendations or something too coming out on this that we just haven't, haven't seen or haven't looked for yet. Um, and let me tell you, the air conditioning, air filters that I see in businesses are probably the... <laughs> lowest quality, highest volume purchased. And so you're not dealing with filtry, let alone HEPA type filters. And then you're gonna have issues of airflow if you use those. So, um, mm -hmm. mm. A lot to think about. Things that make you say, hmm, 